I think we might have to make a few more like, new copies, but in the meantime, you can just share whoever doesn't have a copy. We are <clears throat> we're on um, page one ninety five. Third ice in this Maimir, Matevu Alecha of Tofresh Fetes, 1929. <clears throat> so, in the last ice, it started over giving a mushroom, the mushroom that helps us understand that the higher something is. Or well, let's go the other way around. When you see something falls very low, it's an indication that it comes from a higher source. And the mushroom was with a wall. And the wall is made up of rows of stones. That the stones that are all the way on top, when this wall falls, falls very far. And the stones that are on the bottom, those stones, they fall, but they fall very close to the original source, the original place. So to spiritually, then when we see sparks of godliness, obviously all the sparks of godliness in this world is as if it were fell, because up there in its source, it's in a very spiritual place, and then it, it becomes lower. So we using the metaphor like something that fell. It's not what it used to be. And where did it fall in this physical world? So those places that the spark fell lower comes from a higher source. In order to understand this better, he starts explaining what is the spiritual significance of stones. Stones sometimes are used to, uh, <clears throat> as a metaphor. In fact, very soon we're going to have the parasha by Yetze. Talks about a story of Yaakov Avinu traveling and how he went to sleep on a mountain, which turned out to be Har Maria. And when he went to sleep, he protected himself by surrounding his head with stones. And that partially you'll see the whole big discussion about stones. He put stones here and stones there, 12 stones, and became one stone, and he put a headstone. So Hasidus had explained that stones represent Oseus Hatayna words. So as a, from there, he went on to explain what it says, that two words, with two words you can build, with two stones you can build two houses. Okay. What it means, Baruch is, is with two letters from the alphabet, you can create two words. And with three letters you can create six words. So he gave an example of the three letters, Tzadik, Rej, and He. And that only gave an example of the letters, but he also explained how just the rearrangement of letters has a very deep message. And the message is that Reish Tzadik He means Ratza, desire, want, which means when you go into the words of davening, you do it with the chayas, you're passionate about the davening, you really have a desire to, to uh, daven. Then you can turn things around from Reish, from Tzadik Reish He, which means Torah, and it becomes Tohar, which is light. So it gives an example how each one of the letters, the same letters, but when it's rearranged, it has a different message. Again, we live in a world today with modern technology. Besides all the other benefits of modern technology, one of the benefits that helps to understand Chassid is better. So imagine if somebody has a telephone number, and the number has nine, it's nine numbers or 10 numbers, and you take the same 10 numbers and you rearrange them differently. Are you going to reach the same person? Okay. No, in fact, that's what all the telephone numbers are about. There are millions of numbers, millions. 
And they're all the same number. The only difference is this is five, six, seven, four, three, and this is five, six, seven, three, four. One night you end up in China, or well, the other one you end up in Honolulu. And the same with all the other things. So the word in the Torah, the same letters, they're rearranged differently, they have a different content in it. That's what he was explaining in the previous chapter. We'll see where this is leading to. So now let's go to Gimel. <clears throat> regarding all letters, the way they're combined, the order in which they're combined, that's the what the light that'll be in it, the content that'll be in it, that's in them, and what's around them. In other words, when there are words, there, there's two things. Number one, these words set up a, 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 a keli, a vessel for a certain idea, depending on how you organize the letters. And besides that, it also indicates not a content that's in the words, but around the words. What does that mean, in and around? That's the Hebrew. Teichem pinimi amamaleisam is the content that goes in, and vaseyavaisam is the content that's around the words. What does that mean? Kvein betevis av. Let's take the word av. Ayav alav beis is it means a father. Ariyesh le pirushi b'muvoni. It has the definition, the simple definition, which is it means a father. Yes, and then there's more that comes along with it, things that are outside of the word itself. These are things that are related to the word, but it's not the word itself. Take another example, the word ba. Ba means to come. That's all. Ba alone means to come. But then there is what's around the word, and that is where you're coming from where you're going to, what's the purpose that you're coming. That's not the definition of the word. That's what we call savior. It surrounds the word. It comes along with the word. And we know that every word could mean something different depending on what context it's used. is the same as with all words. Every word has two things in it. There's a content that fills the word. That's the very meaning, the very definition of the word. And also there's a content of what surrounds the word, which means what's the implication of this word? You have a word like simcha, happy, but simcha from what? So it depends what you're saying and who you're talking about. And what, what occurred, what happened. So the word itself is joy, but joy from what? And why is he happy? And how strong is the happiness? And what is it going to lead to? And what led to it? All this is what we call savior, he surrounds the word. Guess what? Uh, we're going to say the word. Implication? <laughs> anyone know what implication means in Hebrew? And anyone know what it means in English? <laughs> I think something like mashmaut is a word. What is it? What does it imply? How is it? How it affects? What can I know from this word? For example, the Chumash it says by Avram Avinu, when he had to do the arcade of Ayashkim Avram Babaika, he got up in the morning. That's the meaning of the word. But as she says, what this implies is that he did the mitzvah with Simcha, so he got up early in the morning. That's called the implication. And that's why Isis letters in the Alabay are called Kalim. Vessels. A vessel 
is something which receives. So this cup receives water. There's a basket you can put into it fruits and vegetables. There are certain things that you can put in other gosh music of things. Then there's a Kali Baruchnis. And that is that words are a vessel that from the words, through the words, and words is something that you can put in uh, logic, a message, a message of intellect or a message of feeling, love, hate, anger, it's contained in the words. So just like a Caleb, they receive in it what you put in. Yes, the Caleb and Kablam Eicha, there are vessels that receive food. Yes, the Caleb and Kablam Mashka. Not all vessels are the same. So, for example, in a basket, you can put food in it. You can put bread in a basket. But you can't put water in a basket. It'll leak out. So the keli that's designed for food is different than the keli that's designed for water. Same thing is also spiritually. That the way you combine the words, it'll be a vessel for a different content. Just like we said in the previous chapter about a house, that the length of the house, the width of the house, the height of the house, it all depends on how many stones you have, the numbers, and also sidram, the order, how you set it up. If you set it up a certain way, the house will be designed one way. If you set it up a different way, the house will be designed a different way. So what he's leading to is that there is Eris and Cain. In the spiritual realm, there's Eris and Cain, which means that there are vessels. Now, when we say vessel, you usually think of a pot, you think of pans, you think of cups, you think of bowls, that's a Cain. But Veruchnius, a Cain is nothing physical. But what is a Cain? A Cain is something that contains something deeper. So, for example, when you use a mushal to explain something, the mushal is the cave, is a deep message. And it's very difficult to explain that deep message. So I give a mushal. So the mushal is the cave, and in this mushal, it contains a deeper message. Words are also cave. When you use words, the message is not the words, the message is something else. The words are just vessels that they carry the messages. So that's why if I want to say something to another person, whether it's something intellectual, or I want to express something emotional, I can say it in all different kinds of words. I can say it in English, I can say it in Hebrew, I can say it in any language, because the words are just technical, and that can change. The content of the word, the feeling that I feel, the thought that I have, the question, the answer, the insight, that's the same. So the feeling and the insight, that's the or, that's the light, that's the real thing. And the words are only a vessel. Because the only way one person communicates to another person is through words. When I explain something, you can't just sit there and think in your head and they can understand it. And you can't just make noise and say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they don't get anywhere. And the proof is when you make hamaytzi, when you wash your hands, nobody knows whatever else is talking about. So they're always going, mm, mm. So you have to say words, you have to say an explanation, a question, an answer. You say something emotional, I love this, I don't like this, I want this to be another way. That message is the light, and the words are vessels. So not only in our world, but in all the spiritual worlds, there is light and there's vessels. <laughs> so let me ask a question. Some of you might remember this question from last year. And if you know the answer, So in the in the in the world of Atsilus, let's say, there are souls there, there are angels there, and there are spheres. Where are the vessels? At the top, at the bottom, in the middle, the backyard. Where are the vessels in the world of Atsilis? What? 
world. Inside the world. But I'm saying in the world there's in the Shamas, souls, there are angels, there are spirits. So is this it means there's four things: angels, the shamas, spirits, and vessels. In the shamas and the shamas, why are they vessels? Mixes are like vessels, that's true. Anyone? Don't be afraid. Nothing's going to happen if you don't give the right answer. And nothing will happen if you give the right answer. <laughs> the question is, if I would draw a map of one of the spiritual worlds, is it Silos, Bria, Yitzira, Sia, and I'll say, I'll put it say right down on the map, in this world is A, the Shabbos, there are souls there, there are angels there, and there are spheres there. Now, I want to put down Caleb. Where, where do I put that down? Is it on top of the Shabbos, under the spheres? Where does it fit into the structure of the world? That happens to be true, but that doesn't explain the vessels. The sphere is the cave. But that's something else than what you just said. The spirit is the cave. In other words, it's not that there are spheres and there are Caleb. A sphere, each sphere consists of a light and a vessel. To explain this with a simple muscle, the 10 spheres are reflected in the human structure, which is we have 10 faculties, Chachma, Bina, Das, and so on. So let's take the brain. The brain consists of three things, Chachma, Bina, and Das. So when you talk about the intellect, there's really two things. One thing is the physical organ of flesh, which is the brain. The second thing is in this physical organ, there's the power of intellect. So which is the or and which is the cave? Which is the energy and which is the vessel? Right, the physical organ of flesh, which is the brain is the vessel. And this brain contains in it the power of intellect. The physical eye, with the physical eye I could see. Let's remember again that in science, they don't recognize in the shaman. So if we ask a scientist, how is a person able to see? They'll say because of the eye. What else? Nothing else, the eye. According to Torah and according to Hasidus, no, the neshama, the soul, is energy and light, and the neshama has the power to see. The neshama's faculty, the power to see, is channeled through the physical eye. So without an eye, God forbid, a person can't see. But the eye is only a vessel, and the power to see comes from the neshama. What are the, uh, the power of hearing? Same thing. The power of hearing comes from the neshama, but that power is channeled through the physical ear. And the power of intellect comes from the neshama, but that power is channeled and it's invested in the brain. And emotion is in the heart, and speech is in the mouth. And the same with all the other parts of a person. So that means that even though we say that the person has 10 faculties, but each one has a place in the body that it's contained. Same thing with Ruchnis. Each sphere, if the one is Chochmah, one is Bina, and one is Das, and one is Chesed. But each sphere consists of a light and a vessel. There's the vessel of Chesed, and there's the light of Chesed. There's the vessel of uh, Chochmah, and there's the light of Chochmah. So if you have to make a map and draw a chart, that's what you would do. The kalim are in the sphere itself. It's part of the structure of the sphere. Is this clear? Or not clear. Now the question is, what do you need the vessel for? With the human being, you need the physical body because 
that the person is in the soul and the body. What does it mean with the spirit? Why is it necessary to have a vessel? What's the function of the vessel? Why can't it just be Chochma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gura? Why? You're right. Right. In other words, just like in the human body, the person wouldn't have the physical brain, just the power of intellect. It would be too powerful and too abstract to be able to use it and apply it to understand the physical world. So by channeling it through the physical brain, the physical eye, the physical ear, the physical mouth, what you're doing is you're taking, taking energy, which is extremely intense and powerful, extremely abstract, and by putting it into a vessel, you're defining it, you're channeling it, you're limiting it so it could be applied in a limited way. And the same is with Hashem's spheres. There are 10 spheres, but if there wouldn't be a vessel, then the light itself would be too powerful, too spiritual, too abstract, even to give a person chesed, because it's too, too abstract to be applied to a person's chesed. So Hashem has to take each sphere, it doesn't have to, but that's the way he created the world. Each sphere is contained in a vessel. The purpose of the vessel is to put a form and define the light and limit it in a certain way. And now it could be channeled in a very specific way. And the same is with words. If you understand something you had, did you ever meet someone, or did it ever happen to you that you have a certain idea about something and someone says, could you explain me why? And you say, no. I mean, I can, I can tell you what I'm thinking, but I don't know how to explain it. Which usually means I don't have the words to explain it. I don't have the right words to explain it. But sometimes people explain and they're talking and talking and talking. They have no idea what in the world they're saying. And that's because they don't have the right words to, to transmit this message. So the purpose of a Kaylee is to take something which is overwhelming, something which is huge, something which is abstract, and be able to sort of put it into a some form or shape which makes it accessible and able to receive it. That's the purpose of the Kaylee. So all this world, all the spiritual worlds, Atsilas, Bria, Yitzira, Asiya, in every world there are spheres, and every sphere consists of a light and a vessel. And the function and the purpose of the vessel is to contain that light. And by containing it, it's able to channel it because otherwise the light is too abstract, too, too strong to be able to be channeled. All this is leading up to the idea of the sparks that we're talking about, elevating sparks, which is all about the Indian of Elam HaToyo, Shviris So we all know, and that's what he's going to talk about here, that Hasidus Kabbalah is very focused on elevating the sparks. I'm drinking water. There's a spark of God in this water. When I make a bracha before, you make a bracha after, then you're elevating the spark of godliness in this water. Where did the spark of godliness come from? And why does it need to be elevated? The answer is because really this spark of godliness comes from a very high source, but it fell from that source. It became much lower, disconnected in some way from the source. And by me making a brach over it, I'm reconnecting it to its original source. In fact, that's why we use the term spark. What's the difference between a light and spark? What? Yes. <laughs> Especially when you're thirsty. Every time I drink water, it goes to my mind. Water, <laughs> sparks. <laughs> So here we have 
um, this term, this is where it all begins, it's called Shvira Sakeh. I'm sure if you learned Hasidus before, it came up before, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's a totally a new subject. Anybody familiar with this a little bit? A little bit, a little bit, okay. So we'll try to explain it. Um, which is the first word we need to explain? The first word we need to explain is the word Oilam Hatoyo, the world, the world of Torah. So it says in Medrash that before Hashem created this world, he created a previous world. And that world is a world of Tohu. And then that world broke. So some people want to say that the reason why we find fossils that are millions of years old, because they come from the first world. But the truth is that whoever says that has completely no concept of what this is all about. We're not talking about a physical world. This is a spiritual world that existed even before the world of Atsilas. And because it's a spiritual world, you're not going to find any fossils of dinosaurs there. The world existed, and then Hashem destroyed this world. And that process of destroying the world is called Shvira Sakelem, the vessels broke. So there's a lot of my Marim and Hasidus explaining what does it mean the vessels broke? What actually happened in that world? And why did they break? And what does it mean Hashem does something and later it breaks? Of course not. This is part of the plan. Hashem created in such a way that it should be first created, then it should break, and then rebuild it. And we, through our mitzvahs, have to rebuild that world. And when the world that we have to build is finished, that's when Mashiach comes. So let's explain the words, Eilam first of all. So Eilam is the comes from the words in Chumash. The first words in Breshas are Breshas Bar Elohim, Sashamay Vesaretz, Hashem created heaven and earth. The next Pasuk says, it was chaos. So Kabbalah says this is referring to a world called the world of chaos because everything fell apart. <laughs> Again, let's remember, we're talking about a world that's spiritual. Nothing, anything near what we see. It's all in a spiritual way. It's not the kind of existence that we know. But something happened there, which metaphorically would be compared to breaking and things falling apart. So one of the ways that this is explained is that, like we said before, every sphere has a vessel. If the light is too intense for the vessel, then the vessel is going to break. So everything has to be in the right measure. For example, this cup. So if you put something in here that's too big for the cup to contain, let's say you wouldn't put in water, you would put in rocks and you keep putting in more and more and more, it'll break because it can't contain so much. It's only so big. Every vessel has a certain measurement, a certain uh, size, what it can think. And if it's more than it can contain, then it falls apart. So same thing with a person. The human body is a vessel. And if a person does things, works so hard that the body can't handle it, then the body breaks, things fall apart. So therefore, in the world of Tohu, what happened was that the light of Hashem that was in these vessels uh, was not a bad thing, it was a good thing, it was so powerful, so intense, so spiritual, but the vessels couldn't handle it. So the vessel broke. And when the vessel broke, the light left and the vessel fell. And the analogy that's given to that is like a person, chas v'shalom, Here's news that, oh, maybe this is actually an example of good news. Sometimes a person could hear good news, but it could be bad news. They hear something that's so shocking and they get so excited and it affects them in such a powerful way that God forbid, their heart gives. I think I told you this once, at least some of you were here last year. <clears throat> and I once heard a speaker speaking about the subject of Mashiach. And he was saying that people are afraid to go out there and tell people that have his message, Mashiach is coming, but they don't realize that actually people will be happy to hear the message. You're afraid, but people out there, 
would be very excited to hear the message. And he gave a muscle. And the muscle was that there was a man who won a $50 million lottery. He didn't know about it, but his family realized that he won it. And they were all excited, but they were very worried. He had a weak heart. And they were worried that if he hears the news that he won $50 million, he's going to get so excited that that could affect his heart because the heart can't handle too much emotion. It doesn't matter if it's bad or good. If it's too much emotion, the heart will chas v'shom give. So they came to his cardiologist and they told him about the problem. So he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Send him into my office. Send him in, check up, starts asking him questions. So how's life? How are things financially? The talking, the talking. And then the doctor says, and tell me, Harry, if you would win $50 million, what would you do with it? So he tells the doctor, you're not going to believe me, but I promise you, I feel so indebted to you. If I would win $50 million, I would give you half. The doctor faints. <laughs> His muscle was, we're supposed to tell the message to people. They're ready to hear it. And the one who's giving the message, they're fainting instead of the one who's receiving the message. So when you hear something, even if it's good news, but it's, if it's overwhelming and your vessel is not strong enough, has shown it could break the vessel. The light in Tohu is a world of Kedusha. And that light was so strong in its feelings of love for Hashem and understanding Hashem. It was so, so strong that the vessels couldn't handle it. And Hashem created it that way intentionally that the vessels were not in proportion to the light and they broke. So what happens Chas Shalom if this takes place? In fact, according to one opinion, that's what happened to Sarah. Sarah Imenu, her husband Avram, took Yitzhak to the Akeda, and the Satan wanted to stop it from happening. So he came to Sarah and he told her, do you know that your husband took your son to sacrifice him on, on, uh, um, uh, uh, as a carbon? And when she heard that, that's how she died. So some say because she heard that her son was being slaughtered, she died. And some say the opposite that you're so emotional about the fact that he's doing such a great act and that did it. But either way, what happened was that her feelings, her emotions were so overwhelming that the body couldn't handle it. So the neshama left the body because the body could no longer contain it. And the body actually lost its life. And that's what happened to the vessels. So if we have to make it in a sort of diagram form, this is what we would describe. That you have this is in Hebrew, it's called Eilam, the world of Tohu. Eilam and Tohu. And in this world, there's a light, or, and there's a cave. Let's see my art. <laughs> <laughs> it looked a little bit different. <laughs> so the light goes into the vessel. And being that there are 10 spheres, there were 10 of those, well, not going to the number, but there were all the spheres. The light goes into the vessel. But this light was too overwhelming for the vessel. So therefore, this broke. When it broke, as I, like I had before, God forbid the body breaks, the soul leaves the body, and the body becomes lifeless. Here, the R went back to its source in a higher place, wherever that is. And the vessel, which is also spiritual, it fell all the way down to our world. And these are the sparks that are in every single item in this room. So you now introduce the sparks of the world of total. Wow. It's all around you the walls, the table, the chair the marker, and the cup of water as well. The keili pieces of keili. That when we say in, 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 the, in metaphoric terms that fell, it means it came down to a lower level. So the sparks of that world came down to this physical world, and it's invested in everything in the physical world. But sparks of the keili. Okay. It's sparks of the keili, right. Yeah. Our yeah. job yeah. is... Right. And our job is when we do mitzvahs, what we're doing is we're, we're taking like a puzzle, fell apart pieces, and we're putting it all together. 
When we do mitzvahs, we're putting the pieces back together again and reconstructing the keli. And when we construct the keli, that light comes back again. The, the, the light that disappeared 5,782 years ago comes back. And when that light comes back, the whole world has a bigger light than that's Mashiach. <laughs> if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask any questions. We'll explain, try to explain at least. So what I'm basically just saying is that a person does a mitzvah and that mitzvah goes back here, the spark goes back, another spark goes back. And basically, we fill up all the pieces. The cave becomes reconstructed, and, and the light comes back. Sometimes you use what? I have to take a picture. Take a picture, just okay. It's like take the human the human body as an example. Let's say we said before that the eye is a cave, and the power of vision comes from the neshama. If chas was shown, there's an accident, and the physical eye is damaged to the point that the person can't see anymore. It's exactly the same thing. The keli was damaged. So what happens to the power of vision? Does the person lose it? No. It goes back to its source in the neshama. You go to a doctor and he says, we can do this through surgery. We can fix whatever is broken. They repair the keli through surgery. Every, whatever happened is put together again. And once it's put together again, the power of vision comes back from the neshama into the eye and they can see again. So when we can reconstruct the keli, this light of Tohu, which is infinitely, infinitely greater than what we have now, will shine again and will shine into this world. What makes it not break again is the fact that this time it was put together through our avoida. That's what makes it not break again. In other words, now the keli has more quality to it, so it could contain that light. What's the glue? The glue? Okay. Put it back to Elmer's glue. <laughs> That's what mix is all about. I mean, it, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual uh, sort of network. We have to don't understand all the aspects of it, but basically, it's Torah mitzvahs and everything we do, which is according to Torah, is part of the process of putting these vessels together. According to Kabbalah, and the way it's explained in Chassidus, that's what everything is all about since the beginning of creation. It's re bringing back those those sparks and, and reconstructing the vessel. Um, we'll learn a little bit later, and that's why it's so historic when the Rebbe said that the vessels have already been completed. So we'll get missing? there. What? So what is missing? Mashiach. Well, we, we'll get there when we we'll talk about that sikh in the, in the Mashiach class. We can't, we can't learn everything at once, because no? then it'll be too overwhelming, <laughs> and the vessels will, <laughs> won't handle it. We only start like this, and then, and then and the day goes, ooh, and then it goes. Listen, if you go, ooh, too much, you know, <laughs> you have the roof. Yes, yes. You keep that, right? We're trying to keep the vessel, remember. Also, a really good example of vessels shattering is like when you put hot water in a glass. It, it can't handle that capacity, so it shatters. Because the heat, or you put something cold in a freezer and, and it turns into ice and the ice mm -hmm. expands, the, the cable breaks because it's too big before it was able to contain. Now it's too big to contain. So with humans, it's usually something which we miscalculate and then realize that this can't handle that. But with Hashem, it was part of a process. He intentionally, initially set it up. It should be a vessel, it should be a light. The light should be strong for the vessel. The vessel should break. And then we, through our avoid of Torah mixes, reconstruct the vessel. And that will alight, allow 
a light that in its own merit is impossible to be contained in a vessel will be able to be contained. And that's the infinite light. Okay, we'll stop here. We want to make sure that yeah, everybody stay down here. Yeah. Don't fly. Oh.